There you go. Uh, next slide, please. But what's, what's key to think, or keep in mind is that most of the 120 million refugees are hosted in low and middle income countries. And while you know there was some headlines last week about Canada being the, the fifth largest receiver of refugee claims or, or people seeking asylum, the truth is most refugees are in the countries um, bordering their host countries. So almost 70% are in neighboring countries. And they're, they make up a significant pop, part of the population of some of the countries that are hosting them. For example, that slide about one in five, that refers to Aruba, which actually have one in five of the people in that, on that island in the Caribbean are actually displaced people. In Lebanon, it's about one in six. So in many countries, they're hosting lar much larger refugee numbers than popular, like a country like Canada, which is much more uh, resources available to it. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to highlight a, a couple uh, situations. First, the Ukraine situation, which should be known to most people. We're now at, while we've seen some back and forth movement, including about, uh, I think it was about 324,000 people, I think, returned to Ukraine last year. Um, I may have gotten that stat wrong, it might be 275. But the point is we're seeing continuing to see movement in and out of Ukraine. And we're at a point where there are about 9.7 million Ukrainians remain forcibly displaced. Many are in the same sort of situation as those in Canada, in, but they're in Europe, where they're under sort of a temporary protection measures provided in a number of the, the EU states. Uh, next slide, please. The Sudan situation, we're at about 8.4 million people as of the 17th of March. But I, I want to draw to your attention that first, uh, still a, a, a large portion of that population is still within the country. But only about 1.7 have crossed the border, but we have many Sudanese still within the borders of Sudan. What's key though, and what the statistics don't tell you, is that the level of support, or the, the level of support we're not getting from the international community um, we're at, I would average is right now we're getting about 8% of the uh, funding for 8% of the needs we've identified. So we're not even making about 10% of the needs we're identified, which of course is adding to the hardship of the and the uncertainty that's going on as this conflict prevails in that country with no sign of a uh, solution. In fact, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine was just in Chad last week and they're reporting and he had been in Chad 20 years prior with, when there was the flight from Darfur, and they're seeing many of the same trends, many of the same phenomena um, and, and challenges among the refugee population, including sexual and gender-based violence, uh, even those who managed to cross the border. Next slide, please. So last year, uh, even though the numbers have gone up to 120 million people displaced and over 30 million of which we could consider refugees under UNHCR's mandate, we were only able to find resettlement for 154,000 people last year. Now, that is actually the largest number we've had in, since about the Syrian movement of 2016, but is still a far cry from the needs of, in terms of what among the refugee population. And I'll explain that a little later. Next slide, please. So as much as I'm presenting, unfortunately, a very bleak picture, um, because much of what I was descri I'm describing in terms of this displacement is also coming at a time when we're seeing many states are coming to us and saying they're actually going to be reducing the funding they're giving to us for our work. And we're seeing that across the humanitarian sector, World Food Program, UNICEF, all are, talk are talking to donors. And we're seeing donors effectively, I'm not sure whether it's donor fatigue or other challenges that they're facing domestically, but even though the numbers are going up, it's the level of assistance going down. That being said, our work is to try to find solutions. And I want to focus in for the time we've got today a bit on what we're doing on third country solutions, um, meaning things like resettlement and complementary pathways, which I'll explain, so that you have an insight at least to what we're trying to achieve in that respect. Next slide, please. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, we about 154,000 refugees were able to uh, be resettled. Some of those were identified by UNCR. Some of those were actually identified through programs like private sponsors, 
sponsorship or comparable programs like in Australia and other countries. Of the refuge, of those 154,000, almost 96,000 were refugees identified by UNHCR. We submit cases, and I'll explain that a bit more in a moment, but we submit cases to countries and they then make a decision. And sometimes those decisions are multi-year in the sense that we may submit a, a case we may submit in 2024, may not depart until 2025 or even 2026, depending on the country they're going to. So the numbers aren't exactly perfect. Canada set a target of 49,000 refugees for res be resettled to Canada this year. That includes 21,000 GARs and other 27,000 PSRs, private sponsored numbers. Um, and so that is quite sizable for those who've been around in the resettlement program for a while but it still is unfortunately within the context that it's well below the number, the needs that we know who are available globally next slide please so we recently released a report about two weeks ago what we call the projected global resettlement needs through which we identify how many refugees we estimate are in need of resettlement globally and this year we've estimated and for 2025 we estimate that 2.9 million refugees are in need of resettlement so we're not saying all refugees need to be settled but we're trying to hone in on those that are the most uh, have the most acute protection risks or the most vulnerable. And again, we come in these multi-million dollar, uh, multi-million figures. What's scary about the 2.9 million is also it's about a half a million larger than it was the previous year, reflecting again the new conflicts that you see in the news every day. Where, the, where refugees are coming from or where they're being resettled from, the most common nationalities we identify in terms of needs are Syrians, Afghans, South Sudanese, refugees from Myanmar and Sudan. And the countries, the largest country hosting refugees needing resettlement are Lebanon, Iran, Turkey, Turkey, Ethiopia, and Pakistan. And you can see at the bottom graph, I know there's a lot of information in front of you, but when you look at each region of the world, except for Turkey, we see growth in terms of the needs, whether you're in the Asia and the Pacific or whether in a different part of the regions within Africa or the Middle East or North Africa, every one of them are seeing increased needs. Next slide, please. So for those who are maybe less familiar with how resettlement works, at least from the identification, we will identify refugees based on a set of categories, which I'll identify, but then we submit these profiles to resettlement countries. Resettlement countries are the ones who actually make the decisions. And they're the ones who say, for example, you know, we would like X number of refugees for referral to our country this year. So we're working oftentimes with countries to try to piece together the various voluntary contribution states where the United States may offer several tens of thousands, Canada may offer several thousands, Germany may offer these thousands, and we're trying to get them, align them up where we identify the needs. But ultimately, the, these numbers and who comes will be decided by the resettlement countries. Next slide, please. So I, I, I referenced this in terms of who we try to identify. And I explained that we focus our work around for resettlement on those refugees who are most at risk, those who are most vulnerable. When I say this, I'm talking about the situation of refugees inside their country of asylum. So they're already refugees and effectively they cross a border and they're effectively refugees once more or facing some of the same thing, factors that force them to flee. So think of, for example, the LGBTQI refugee who flees their, a person who flees their country, comes to a neighboring country and experiences the same sort of persecution in the neighboring country and is not able to find protection. These are the sort of people we call legal and physical protection need. Or it could be a refugee who's being detained or it could be someone facing forced return to the country of origin or some sort of violence uh, or oppression uh, from either possibly even not even the host country, but from other refugees. But one of the other common uh, categories we identify refugees in need of resettlement for are survivors of violence and torture, where we don't have the psychosocial safety net or supports necessary for the refugees. Where our hope is that they will be able to receive them when they are resettled. For those people who have been involved in uh, refugee resettlement for a long period of time, you may remember prior to the Syrian movement, the Iraqis were the number one nationality being resettled. At that time, the most common category, the most common reason we were referring Iraqis was actually survivors of violence and torture. And many of them actually had been young people who had experienced this. And the hope was that through resettlement, they would get the supports they needed. The third most common 
uh, category that we identify uh, refugees based on needing resettlement is actually medical need, uh, sorry, women and girls at risk. Women and girls at risk is, is, is a category that's to acknowledge gender-based persecution uh, and acknowledge that there are certain per forms of persecution unique to women and girls and to help encourage a proactive effort to try to find solutions for them. And we are somewhere in the 10 to 20% of all the referrals we made to Canada last year were actually women and girls at risk. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see there, just for the slide quickly, the, the, again, the yellow, the red, the blue, those are those categories I was talking about. And you can see they make up the vast majority of the referrals of, of future guard clients. Next slide, please. So I just want to highlight uh, in the face of all these needs, you know, where are we prioritizing our efforts? And I'm just going to call, talk quickly about five situations. Uh, first, next slide, please, Bahar. So the serious situation, unfortunately, the international community is showing less and less interest in, in the serious situation. Uh, for those who may recall, the, you know, the um, Arab Spring started back in 2011. Um, it's been many years now that the conflict is going on in Syria, yet we, as, you know, Syrians are still one of the largest nationalities displaced, even though we're hearing reports of forced returns back to Syria, and we still believe it is not safe for Syrians to be returned to Syria. Um, they are the largest nationality, but yet we're starting to see states basically indicating that they're, again, they want to move their settlement uh, interests elsewhere, which is a challenge because many of the countries hosting Syrians are also ex expressing various levels of fatigue. Next slide, please. The Central Mediterranean uh, situation actually covers about 40 different countries uh, who are basically moving on the route from throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and through Saharan Africa towards Libya and Tunisia. Now, about 1,900 people died on the boats uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean last year. Our hope is trying to provide resettlement earlier in the States, is trying to prevent people from unnecessarily risking their lives, but also for those who follow the situation in Libya, the situation in that country is quite difficult, and quite bleak for the migrants who go there hoping to travel. And so many can end up in detention, detention by non-state agents. And oftentimes we don't even have access to them. Uh, so we have been working with a number of different countries to try to relocate uh, persons from Libya to other countries, Rwanda and Niger, where we actually undertake refugee status determination, and then if they are determined their need resettlement, we are referring them on to other countries. This is one of our highest priorities because, again, we're the interest in trying to provide solutions for refugees sooner, and you're going to hear more about this, uh, the sort of en route approach, trying to provide protection to persons who may need it much sooner than before they go to, you know, travel through many states seeking it. Next, next slide, please. The Venezuela situation is one such, actually, the, the route-based approach uh, applies most to. The uh, last year, you may have heard of the number of people who've gone through the Darien Gap. It's a difficult uh, and dangerous part of Panama from the, I believe it's the uh, Colombian border, as the people try to make their way north. And uh, you may have seen some media coverage in terms of, but it's harsh conditions, large number of people dying. We're starting to see extra regional people traveling through this jungle area. Uh, but over 400,000 people have gone through this as they try to make their way north, hoping to find uh, many, hoping to find the way to the United States. We've been working with a number with the United States, with Canada, Spain, and a number of countries in the region to try to develop um, what we call safe mobility offices in this right now they're in um costa sorry costa rica guatemala colombia and ecuador where people can basically come forward and say if they've got a protection problem or they're seeking to migrate they can come forward and we can see if they would be eligible for the u.s based program or any other resettlement program or they if they might be uh, eligible for any sort of migration route so it, this is part of our uh, approach of trying to provide protection to people or provide fight solutions to people much sooner in their journey as opposed to them going traveling onward and again risking much danger uh, and trying to find a way to the United States. Next slide please. 
the Rohingya situation, particularly in Bangladesh, doesn't get much coverage. Yet we've we've had a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, release where I have had a turning point with the government of Bangladesh, who for years was reluctant to allow resettlement to go from the country. Instead, we're now able to do do large scale resettlement. And this year, we are, I believe, referring about a thousand uh, Rohingya inside Bangladesh who will be eventually finding their way to resettlement programs across Canada. The United States is doing about ten thousand this year, but we plan they plan to do a uh, large number, similar numbers in the future years, in the effort to do some large scale resettlement of the Rohingya from Bangladesh, as those who people worked with this population before. They have been neglected in many ways in terms of assistance and gaps in education, and it will be a challenge, but this will also be an incredible life changer for um, many people who've had no potential opportunities for, for years. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, the Afghan situation, which has gotten such coverage in Canada and is, is also a priority for us. The Afghan situation, is, as you know, maybe has been a challenge, particularly as Pakistan and Iran, who host the largest numbers. Um, for Iran, we have a hard time finding a number of states where we're able to resettle refugees from. In Pakistan, they, it's been much more difficult trying to organize departures from the country. So while they have hosted tens of thousands of Afghans for many years, um, we've had to also manage the relationship with these host countries so that we can uh, leverage solutions for Afghans. Next slide, please. In addition to all those situations which we're prioritizing globally, uh, Canada has a number of specific programs I just want to highlight. One is that Canada's what they call the Urgent Protection Program. Canada has given up to this year, it's actually increased, gives us about 200 spaces a year for refugees to come to, to be resettled on an emergency basis. And I just offered those slides to show that it's not a focus on one particular nationality, but a variety of nationalities and a variety of operations have benefited and taken advantage of this. Now, oftentimes service providers are unaware that a per, uh, their client has come through the UPP, as we call it, um, but it's been a real, uh, a really important tool for us in providing protection for, for refugees, particularly those who have some of the most acute protection problems. N next slide. And, and those key people going through that program are oftentimes people coming out of detention. And you can see it right here. This is a better explainer. Those people who are coming through the program, as you can see, that every year we've, we've put, you know, enough, we've, we try to track uh, what's their protection issue, what's the issue that they had to come on an emergency basis. And the reasons most common are, of course, women at risk for sexual gender based violence, risk of rape mob, that means forced return to their country of origin, or they are LGBTQI or in detention. Next slide, please. The other uh, program that Canada, the special program that Canada has, is uh, that you may have heard of, it's Human Rights Defender Program. And there are about 500 slots given, 250 to UNCR, and then there's two other organizations who identify uh, potential HRD uh, human rights defenders for this uh, initiative. The most common among the profiles we uh, have identified, the most common profiles are actually women rights activists or journalists, as well as pro-democracy activists. So it's it's a new program. We're start, still starting to see it. We've actually been given a few more spaces than last year, but we're starting to see its impact in terms of the, the various areas of activism that uh, people are are utilizing for this through this program. And the notion is that they can come to Canada. They can while they're being resettled, they also have a, an opportunity to continue their activism from here. In addition to all that resettlement, I mean, given the, this gap we have between uh, the needs and the number of spaces, as much as I said, you know, uh, the 154,000 was a banner year because we've never seen these numbers, it's still far from the 2.9 million that we've identified in terms of overall needs. So one of the things that the Global Refugee Compact that came out a few years back has been pushing for is the idea of, in addition to resettlement, developing complementary pathways legal immigration pathways that refugees can access that is in addition to resettlement, not at the expense of resettlement. And so in the Canadian context, these are things like private sponsorship, uh, scholarships, and uh, labor mobility, what we would call Canada's economic immigration program. About 250 refugees plus have uh, come to Canada since about March 
through labor mobility, we're starting to see those numbers rise significantly um, as we give their new routes of, available and there's a uh, growing employer interest in this area. But all of that work is trying is not at the expense of resettlement. It is in addition. And uh, yes, so I mean, it, it, I, I can't underline that enough. What, this is why it's so important that, uh, again, to try to provide more solution spaces to refugees. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is effectively three different goals. And this is part of a, what we call Roadmap 2030. It's a, it's a strategy that we've come together with states and with uh, um, states and NGOs and UNICR. And first, our goal is to, we need to grow resettlement. We need more places. We need more countries and more places. But secondly, we need to develop further these complementary pathways. And you can see that where, for example, in the United States, they have developed their version of um, Welcome Corps what they, with their version of the private sponsorship program as a way to try to expand more solution spaces. But the third goal is, and so, and I'm talking about not just in Canada, but of course globally, but the third goal is also welcoming and inclusive communities because we cannot have, again, try to bring people unless they're able to receive well and welcomed in the communities they come from. So we know that public support is so critical to uh to this next slide please and and you can see this again some just some references to the numbers i'll next slide in the interest of time and those are some just some potential resources and if you're interested i can put those in the chat and i will i think i may have used up my time so uh next slide thank you very much great thank you michael uh, so we will open it up to questions. Um, okay, I will go to the chat box. Here we go. Um, so I'm not sure if you can speak to this, but um, Canada has 3250 applications of Sudanese needing protection. Right. Um, has Canada closed the applications for this group? Uh, what I think the person is asking about is the special measures that Canada's introduced um, for uh, people who were affected by the events of April 14th, 2023. So that applies to Sudanese and non-Sudanese who were in Sudan. And what they're allowing is if, uh, if you have a family member in Canada willing to serve as an anchor, you're, they're able to come to Canada uh, through the special measure through which 3,250 applications are accepted. Last I heard, I think they had closed it. I think they had hit their ceiling, but that may change. And I, I, I'm, I'm oftentimes reluctant to cite a number because I've heard different numbers from the officials. And I know there's obviously been a lot of public interest and a lot of public questioning in terms of what's the ceiling, what's appropriate and such. But last I heard, I think they have uh, they have hit it, but uh, please don't cite me as a source for this because it would be better to hear from IRCC on that. Um, why has the Rohingya, Rohingya, Rohingya situation been stalled? Well, I mean, I can't speak for the host states. Uh, I mean, as if you follow events in Myanmar, I mean, there's a great deal of unrest going on in the country right now. So the possibility of return has not really been there. We have been trying for some time we were, uh, to work with the host countries to try to find solutions for Rohingya, we're just grateful that they, uh, you know, that they are allowing us now to do it, and that's why we want to do it in large numbers to show that the international community will support the government of Bangladesh in hosting the the Rohingya population by, you know, not just providing financial assistance, but providing solutions for uh, hopefully thousands of thousands of Rohingya through resettlement. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I think this is based on one of the slides that you shared, but it says, why are there so few refugees accepted based on medical needs? Is there a cap? On that? no, that's, a, that's a great question. Because many of you will say, oh, you know, if you work with refugees, or many of my clients have, have medical needs. When we refer a refugee based on medical needs, first Canada has a notional uh, ceiling of only 5% of the referrals we make to Canada should be um, what they call um, high medical needs. But when we do it based on our own category, we're looking at two or three things. One, is it a condition that is treatable 
with uh, so it's not just a disability that there's for which there's no cure but is it a condition that is treatable in the country uh, in the country of resettlement and is it the will of that country now the the challenge is that you know countries only give us a small number of spaces oftentimes to say because they don't have to say yes to the people who refer for resettlement so we're oftentimes trying to manage this in terms of um the number of uh, excuse me manage the number of submissions we make to states. That being said, we oftentimes will make ref resettlement referrals because, you know, for example, there are, uh, say the principal applicant um, was in danger of being forced to return to their country of origin, but one of the children had a disability. And so for you as a service provider, you're, 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 you're providing service to the whole family, not just the principal, principal applicant. So for you, this might be you know, seemed like a medical case, but for us it didn't because our focus was on finding a solution for the principal applicant and his, and his, and his or her dependents. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question I think um, you can mention what we discussed earlier, which is um, it does UNHCR work with um, refugees from Palestine or how does thank it? You. Under the convention, or at least under our man, we're only able to work with the Palestinians who are not in countries covered by UNRWA. So we're not involved with Palestinians in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Jordan. And I also believe in Egypt, we're not uh, active there either. And so with Palestinians, anywhere else we they they come under our mandate and this is the way the uh, united nations set up the system so that where a refugee is under the mandate of unra the un relief and works agency they're the agency responsible for them not unhcr but we do make resettlement referrals all the time and provide assistance to palestinians where they meet the convention refugee definition where they are outside of those countries thank you um and I think this is referring to another slide in terms of the numbers um, of folks from Eastern DRC, why are the numbers low? And I'm not sure if the person means numbers low coming to Canada or in general. <laughs> well, that would be the number, uh, I probably you probably saw where it was actually the number or need of resettlement. The numbers in, in the you know, Eastern Kivu is a part of uh, the DRC. I mean, the situation is quite terrible there. And, and another example of a situation which does not get the attention it deserves. Um, I know that there's been actually some effort, particularly by the United States, to, to try to increase resettlement of refugees from the DRC, from Congolese from the DRC. And we're seeing that particularly in Uganda, uh, to a lesser extent, Kenya and, and such. But you know, they're certainly, they are certainly one of the the top five nationalities referred for resettlement usually. And I think they're one of the top five nationalities received by Canada in terms of resettlement as well. Great, thank you. And I think I'll keep this our last question mainly because of time. Um, one last question is um, what is, uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but what is um, the role of UNHCR in terms of like encouraging peace efforts in countries where refugees are coming from? Like, no, thank, thank you. And this is, this is a really key question, right? Because we are a neutral, independent agency in the sense that we have to reflect the neutrality of the United Nations when we do our work and we count on that sense of neutrality. We are not uh, taking sides in terms of the conflict or whatever conflict that may be. And we need to be able to work with states. And in many ways, you know, we are a non-political organization swimming in very political waters. So we are oftentimes delivering services and providing assistance to refugees from one particular country on their, where they're refugees. And we're also providing assistance to the same population who haven't yet, not yet crossed the border on the other side where they're just internally displaced. So it can be quite difficult, as you can imagine, navigating uh, those relationships. One of the challenges we have is actually it's more the international community because it's actually the, the UN General Assembly and states who are supposed to negotiate peace. It is supposed to negotiate these efforts and we count on that. Otherwise, we're sort of, again, trying to work with neutral, but unless you know there are um, efforts to find peace and such, our resolvement so many of the world's conflicts, 
you know, we just continue to try to deliver services uh, year in and year out. Amazing, thank you. So thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's always great to hear from you in HCR. Um, and uh, the questions, there's a couple questions we didn't get to. However, we do have to move on. So thanks again, Michael, for joining us thank today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate you thanks. Being, being here. And I will move forward to the next presentation. Um, so I'd like to introduce Jennifer York. Jennifer has worked at ISS of BC for 19 years in frontline and management roles for federally and provincially funded employment and settlement programs. Her current role as Director of Refugee Programs provides oversight with the Resettlement Assistance Program, or RAP, a program that supports newly arrived government-assisted refugees, which are referred to as GARs, to Canada, and also the Safe Haven SOS Program that serves refugee claimants. Jennifer has an Executive Master of Business Administration and a, and a Certificate for Responsible Leadership from Queen's University. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Bahar. Um, so just thank you everyone for, for the opportunity to share a bit about the um, context of BC and some information and stats that we have seen for government assisted refugees and refugee claimants. Uh, next slide. So first off, I'd like to take the time to acknowledge the land that um, I'm gathered and where I work, play, and live is on ceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam nations. However, currently I'm at Souk, and so um, we'd also like to acknowledge the Souk and the Chinuit nations. It's important for me to do land acknowledgement simply not because it has to be done, but it's a reminder of a process that I regularly go through to learn history and stories of the Indigenous people prior to colonization and to relearn Canada's history from the Indigenous lens, as well as reflect my place in this country as a settler, and how we and I can work together with Indigenous people. It's also appreciative of the land that I am a guest on and the privilege to enjoy and admire um, with my life here. Next slide. Just very overview of ISS at BC. Um, it was created in 1968 to, in response to Ismailis Ismaili fleeing East Africa. Um, and we are an immigrant serving agency that provides a multicultural um, services, large multicultural immigrant serving agency in Canada. We have pioneered a fair number of services that includes the settlement service, the host program, um, and refugee reception in BC. We are the only RAP service provider in Metro Vancouver. We have served over 25,000 clients per year in 45 languages and have 16 primary locations. We have close to 450 staff and volunteers, and we are both an NGO and a charity. And our board of directors come from selected um, volunteers from a broader community. Uh, next slide. Um, just some of the service centers that we have in, 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 um, in Metro Vancouver. Next slide. I think before I get, begin with some of the data and the information, I just want to make sure that we all have the same understanding of immigration process to Canada. Um, and these are, these are some of the categories that are existing. And the important of this is because the different types of services and supports varies based on the status. So if you look at this listing here, the first um, four immigrants, government assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees, and blended visa office referrals, um, they are considered they, they are permanent residents. And so they are able to access most of the services and supports um, as, as most Canadian citizens would. The other one that we have also in Canada is temporary status. And refugee claimants are considered under temporary status as well as international students, temporary foreign workers, and some measure, special measures um, such as QIT um, programs such as that. Next slide. And so as we talk about refugees, um, again, it's very important to understand what refugees mean in Canada because we have different types. We have resettled refugees, government assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees, or blended visa referrals. Um, and then and, and we also have refugee claimants. So resettled refugees in Canada, um, they fit the definition of UNHCR, uh, convention definition, which are people who have fear, well founded fear of persecution because of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, membership in a particular group. Um, and they have left their own country, they're in a third country, and the only durable solution that seems to be possible is resettlement. 
As I mentioned earlier, when they arrive in Canada, they are considered permanent residents. And so the services that they are able to access, such as IRCC funded settlement programs, uh, link language programs, employment programs, and a variety of other things, um, as most other permanent residents, such as immigrants would receive. Um, next slide. And so here is something that this, this information uh, is from IRCC. And it's admission of resettled refugees by census metropolitan area in BC of attended destination. And this data is quite long. It's from January 2015 to March 2024. Um, you'll see that most of the government assistant refugees are in Vancouver, and, but also in other, other cities such as Victoria, Kelowna, Abbotsford, Nanaimo. And this is because there are other RAP service providers as well, in addition to the Metro Vancouver with ISIS of BC. What's also interesting is Vernon has some government assisted refugees, and this is likely from Operation Syria. What's important to note is that when people are destined to these cities, it does not mean that that is where they will settle. And so it is possible for people to be destined to, let's say, um, Vancouver and decide to move elsewhere. And so this is not a reflection of where people have settled, but where they have destined as resettled government assisted refugees. Um, you'll also notice that there are other communities that have privately sponsored refugees. Um, and so they are beyond the places where government assisted refugees are destined and as well as uh, blended visa office referrals. And that gives you a sense of how many government assisted refugees have come to, I mean, sorry, how many ref resettled refugees have come to um, BC during this period of time. Um, next slide. The next couple of slides I'm going to show you is um, information from ISS of BC with, in terms of our government assisted refugees. So these are people who are destined to Metro Vancouver um, coming through our RAP program at ISS of BC. Uh, the information that I'm showing is really just for the first quarter, um, just to give you a sense of what's happening um, in the last little while. There have been 611 um, individuals who have arrived to, to BC, directly arrived to BC. Um, and that's about 255 families in this first quarter. There have also been secondary migration. So people who have come from other provinces who decided that they want to come to BC, and that's about 145 individuals or 55 families. And self relocated means that they have um, maybe settled and decided to come to BC, which is about 21 individuals or 10 families. And the reason why it's really important to look at secondary migration and self location as well is because um, it also means that there are people who are not originally destined to Metro Vancouver. Again, our data here is for Metro Vancouver, but there are people who are moving to Metro Vancouver as well. And so that's an important piece to also be aware of because the services and support is also needed um, um, for that. And the total number of GARS, government assistant refugees that we have received in the first quarter was 777 individuals or 320 families. Next slide. So to give you a sense of where the top five source countries are, um, you'll see that a large number are from Afghanistan, then Syria, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, Burma, and Somalia. Um, and, and one thing to note is being the first quarter, this is when the Afghan special initiative was nearing ending. And so we may see changes in terms of the number of Afghanistan, people from Afghanistan coming to Canada. Uh, coming to BC. Um, and you can see there's starting to be more diversity in terms of where other people are coming from. It's not focused primarily on Afghanistan and Syria. We're starting to see diversity in um, other countries, which makes it really interesting in terms of services because of the language needs, the cultural competency, and the support being able to provide for a variety of people and different needs as well. Um, and so that's going to be very interesting as we move into the next quarter and moving forward, um, what the top source countries will be. In terms of the age break breakdown, um, as, as Michael sort of mentioned, there's a fair number who are under 18. And so 45% um, in the first quarter who arrived are 18 years and younger. 
and 55 is 18 years and older. And I think it's really important to really consider about the services and supports, not only for um, you know, youth program, children's program, preschool program, but also for funding for school. As this being the first quarter, if 45% of the children are coming and they're gonna be looking at schools, um, some of the schools funding is looked at during September. And, and so some of the school boards do not necessarily have, certain schools may not necessarily have the support needed for the influx of the young children who are coming to the school system. So, you know, how it's looking at funding at schools is looking at the services and support throughout the year where refugee under 18 come at various points in time in the year. What's also important to think about is even though seniors is only 1%, there is very limited supports for seniors who are, um, may not speak the language um, or in situations where there's family breakdowns. They're not no longer supported by their family because there's you know dis disagreements or family breakdowns. Or in some cases, they've come ahead before their family. So we have seen some seniors who arrived in Canada prior to family members. And so they do not have the language or um, some of the skill levels because they have been dependent on their families who have not arrived in Canada. And in some cases, we have also seen where um, there is no family support. So seniors have come here by themselves. And so there's limited or no support at all um, during their arrival here. One of the things that um, the stats that I'm showing doesn't reflect on is we've also seen a large number of single individuals coming. Um, so we tip, we still have big families. We still have the family size, um, varied family size, but we're also seeing a fair number of individuals coming by themselves. Um, some of them are LGBTQ. Some of them are just coming here on their own. Um, and that actually creates a situation where we need to think about housing, for example, because housing as a single person is really is not affordable. And for people who identify as LGBTQ, finding that safe house where they can share the space um, is also a challenge. Um, as you can imagine, you know, often, you know, finding roommates, it's easier if you find roommates from the same community, but there's also fear of finding housing with the same community because um, the uncertainty of how people may view um, their sexual orientation. Top 10 languages that we have seen in the first quarter, Pashto and Dari, um, languages that are sp spoken in, in Afghanistan, Arabic, Rohingya, Somali, Swahili, Kenya, Rwanda, Farsi, Spanish, and Alkalon. Um, and this is just the top 10. As you can see, it is quite varied and diverse. And that's something that we're starting to see, you know, more often as we move forward in terms of, of the, the arrivals that we receive is we're seeing great diversity in languages where interpreters are um, sometimes limited. In some languages, it's it's fairly new that, you know, they, there's not a huge population. And so trying to find interpretation to provide first language first um, language support is challenging, but even as they move into the community as well. Um, some of you are service providers and trying to think, okay, what languages and supports are out there? It is very diverse and it is quite varied. Next slide, thank you. Um, top 10 destinations and no surprise there, 76% have been moving to Surrey in this first quarter. What is interesting is we're starting to see a increase emergence of Delta becoming a Cree recipient. In this case, in the first quarter, we're seeing 15%, about 49 individuals who are moving into Delta. Um, and in Vancouver is 4%, New Westminster in this first quarter was 1% and Coquitlam 1%. Um, and so we're starting to see a shift away from traditional places where people are moving, Vancouver, New Westminster, Burnaby and Coquitlam, and starting to see that they're moving more towards the Fraser Valley. Um, and so that's something, again, very, you know, something to be aware of is where people are moving and what services are available, um, both settlement and, and, and some other services such as schools, um, community centers, um, you know, other supports that's out in the community. Next slide. Again, a very important slide is just looking at self-transfer from the original destination. So in one of the slides that I showed you earlier saying that this is where some of the um, government assisted refugees have resettled in, in British Columbia, in different cities and different communities, and really mentioned that even though they're destined to those cities, it does not necessarily mean that they're gonna be settling there. And here's a great example of something like this. So there are um, government assisted refugees who are destined to different cities throughout Canada, 
And within that first quarter, we've had 145 individuals, 55 families who have moved to uh, Metro Vancouver. And we know this because government assisted refugees, um, you know, they have about a year's support once from the time they arrive, they have a year support. And so they would often be in contact with us during that first year of movement. And so this is most people are moving to Metro Vancouver within the first year. Um, and, and various reasons why they move to Metro Vancouver. I mean, some of them that I'm aware of would be weather, but often it's connection with family. Um, they've heard certain things about um, uh, Metro Vancouver um, and just the community, you know, being able to connect with people who are nearby or people they are familiar with. Next slide. So that is you know, a quick overview of the government assisted refugees. And, and that information that I've just shown there is really with ISSBC GAR bulletin, which you're able, to, which is available on our website. Um, we do try to have information every quarter. And so then you would be able to see the next update, um, you know, in, you know, the second quarter, hopefully in the near future. The other group of refugees that exists, and, and there's been a lot more attention is refugee claimants. And so the you know, Refugee Protection Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada um, hears and decides claims of refugee protection for people who are coming through the borders. Um, and so people who are either you know, coming through the borders as port of entry upon arrival in Canada or making an inland claim, um, they are stated, trying to, they are claiming that they require safe protection. And the um, IRB determines if they meet the needs of convention, you know, NHCR's convention refugees, as well as if they are in need of protection. And so if they are found to be well founded, founded to be fear of persecution, um, then they become protected person where um, they are considered convention refugees, and, and then they are able to apply for permanent residency. Um, some terminologies that I've kind of put on the slide is asylum seekers, so people who are see seeking asylum. Asylum seekers does not necessarily mean they are able to stay in Canada or not, because it's not de able to determine if they are a refugee. And again, that's going through the refugee claim process. Refugee claimants is someone who's made a claim to, for protection. And again, there's still that process of determination. So they've put in a claim, but it does not necessarily mean that they are a refugee and they are able to um, have positive determination and are eligible for protected person. And as a protected person is someone who's conser considered um, convention refugee or needed for protection and then eligible to apply for, um, for eligible to apply for uh, permanent residency. Next slide. Just to give you a sense of the claims process. So the red is, um, sorry, the purple is the total. The blue is the number of asylum seekers who've come through the airport in British Columbia. The red is through the border and the green is through inland. And as you can see, inland refugees is the higher number. A lot of people go through, a lot of asylum seekers use the inland, um, make claims through inland. As you can see, there has been a substantial growth, especially in 2023. Um, COVID saw a bit of a dip because there, the borders were closed and so less inland, less people crossing through the border or going through the airport. However, as you saw, when the borders opened up, you can see a huge increase in 2023, the number of asylum claims made um, during that period. What's important to note is if you look at 20 to 24, which is the last column, that is only for the first quarter. And if this rate continues the way it is, it may exceed what the numbers were in 2023. Um, and so that's that's there's an increase in claim process. And we hear that anecdotally, I think, with many service providers um, in the community as well. Next slide. And so in this slide, it's just to give you a sense of some of the top 10 countries um, who made asylum claims in Canada. Um, the top 10 countries is determined through the numbers in 2023. Um, and, and so you can see the top 10 countries are Mexico, India, Nigeria, Turkey, Colombia, Iran, Haiti, um, Pakistan. I put in Afghanistan just so that there's, um, you know, even though it's the 11th one, um, I put it in there just so to have a sense of, of where they fit in terms of the asylum claims to Canada. Next slide. 
And so this next slide, however, is refugee claimants to Metro Vancouver through the people that have been served by ISS of BC. And so this does not necessarily reflect the number of people who came to British Columbia or Metro Vancouver, but it's people who served through us um, the last calendar year. And you can see it's quite different from what their arrivals are from Can uh, for, for, for nationally. Um, people who are coming from Iran, um, Afghanistan are, are top two. Um, and in the other countries as well. And some of them are, um, for example, India is one of the top asylum seekers in, in, in Canada. Um, it's much lower here um, for, for people who are making coming to services in through SOS program. Next slide. So wanted to talk a little bit about the Canada's immigration level plans, and I think it's looking forward and I, it's important to have a bit of understanding of that because as we plan or look into sort of the services and supports um, as, as service providers um, or, or supporting, um, you know, the refugee population. And, and so the, the um, government, IRCC, um, Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, IRPA, requires that the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, IRCC, to table projected a projection of permanent residency admissions um, to Parliament every year. And that is the immigration level plans. This is a multi-year plan detailing how many immigrants will be welcomed as permanent residents under a variety of categories. And that's including economic, family, refugees, and humanitarian programs. Um, and the targets are three year, pro, uh, three year rolling time frame, where the first year is a firm target, and then the notional targets for the second and third year, allowing for flexibility. So when making consideration of the immigration level plans, there's a few things that the Canadian government or the, you know, needs to take in consideration. It's looking at the objectives for immigration as set out by Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Program, ERPA. It's also looking at government priorities and policies the economic and regional needs of the community, um, international obligations with respect to refugees and offering protection in those needs, as well as looking at IRCC's ability and its partners to screen and process application and the capacity to settle and integrate newcomers um, to the community. Next slide. So the current plan um, is to the number of permanent residents will be 485,000 um, in 2024, 500,000 in 2025, and 500,000 in 2026. Um, and this includes all newcomers. So this includes the refugees, the immigrants, the family reunification numbers. Um, the, since since um, 2017, there's been an increase of 1.25 to Canada's population, but there's also an interest in building the French-speaking permanent residents outside of Quebec. Um, the um, next slide. And so um, in terms of the immigration levels, um, you'll notice that refugee and humanitarian classes are just over 16%, um, as well as the other 16%, other 16 whereas an economic class for 60% and family class for 24%. So if you take the previous numbers and you take 16%, that will give you a sense of how many refugees are intended to be resettled into Canada. And it could be government-assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees, or BVORs. What is important to note is there is plans to increase the number of privately sponsored refugees and decrease the number of government assisted refugees to Canada. To give you a sense as well, how many um, BC will receive, we typically receive about 10 to 12% refugees from the, the Canadian total. And how many tend to come to Metro Vancouver? It's about 75 to 80% of that coming to Metro Vancouver. What's also interesting about the levels planning um, for 2024 is the government is looking to expand to include temporary resident arrivals in addition to permanent residents. Um, and this is the plan is to reflect that newcomers both have permanent and temporary pathways to resident status and um, hoping to create a more welcoming community. Um, what you know details of that has not you know, not been out, but it's it's important to note that this is the first time that they have looked at levels planning 
with temporary residents in mind. Um, so it hopefully will better align with our immigration systems and the needs of the country. Um, thank you. I think one of the big stories that we're witnessing is there are a higher number of GARs, government assistant refugees, uh, resettled refugees, and refugee claimants as well. Um, and it's also entering different, you know, in cities that are not typically where um, we have seen refugees settle. Again, like I said, Delta, Mid Fraser Valley, a lot of them are moving towards areas um, outside of, you know, the typical city, Vancouver, Burnaby, New West. And it's gonna have an increased demand and realignment of our services in these new areas as well. Um, it's, it's a shift of what's available and, and how it's available um, to those who are actually needing the support. Um, you know, and questions that we often hear about is what about housing, right? Um, what about the services that are available? Um, we know a lot of services tend to be focused in Metro Vancouver or in Van city of Vancouver as well. What does that mean over time as people are moving away from um, the city of Vancouver or into different, different communities. Um, while it, you know, my, the, the data that I've shown isn't very evident, there has been increased individuals who are settling in as well as Richmond, Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Um, so again, quite a change in where people are going to and where they're settling, um, not the space where um, we have been typically, you know, focused on or, or, or where service providers are often located. And so that may change how we, um, again, realign our services. And I often like to end my presentation with something to really think about refugees as, you know, um, when they arrive in British Columbia as refugees, they are no longer victims. They are survivors and their resilience and strength are to be admired and celebrated. And I think that's always an important piece to remember that they are not victims, but they are, um, they are, you know, we want to build capacity, empower, and, and, you know, provide, you know, have them um, in the community um, and, 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 and be part of our, 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 our fabric of our society. Okay, next slide. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I will just, yeah, okay, perfect. So we will take some questions for Jennifer. We are a little bit over time, but I do, want to I did see one question which was asking about the difference between um the when refugee claimants arrive between the border inland and airport like what is the difference is inland so inland is when they have arrived from maybe a different status um they may have come as a visitor and made a claim at you know upon arriving into Canada um, when they're at the border or at the airport, um, they are also, um, they may have made a claim at the border or at the airport. And so that's where often CBSA may be involved in making referrals to um, the claim process, to services that may help them with the refugee claim process. Okay, great. Um, and then someone was asking about, do you have any data on how many displaced Ukrainians have arrived in British Columbia? Um, I don't have that data. Um, I, I, I was actually going to share this link. It's, um, Operation Ukrainian Safe Haven, and they have all of the, um, data right on their website. So I'll just put that link in the chat box for everyone. They have really, really great data, like probably one of the best I've seen in terms of the way they're um, presenting it. So I've left that there for you. Um, and yeah, I don't see too many other questions. Um, so I will probably, if there's no other questions, I will, since we're 10 minutes over, I will probably just do some closing remarks. Um, Jennifer and Michael, is there anything, any other final comments you'd like to leave us with before we sign off? Feel free. <laughs> Uh, n n nothing profound other than, again, to express my appreciation uh, to the work everybody does to uh, help people find their first steps in Canada. Um, one of the things I, I've spent some time looking at data and um, outcomes in relation to integration, some of which is based on uh, census data and such. And one of the things we found out is that, you know, the Canadian experience has been very positive in terms of 
refugee outcomes. That doesn't mean this isn't hard. It's very hard that first few periods. In fact, some argue that first 10 years can be some of the most difficult years. But what's key about the Canadian experience is that every year it gets better. And, and it's incremental, but it does improve. And that's not this case in every other country where sometimes the situation plateaus for people and they don't continue to do better. So whether you are working in frontline services uh, as, a, as a settlement agency or whether you're working in health or schools, quite frankly, schools don't get enough attention or recognition for the important work they do in terms of integrating. This is so foundational to the future success and of our, our neighbors, our, our fellow Canadians and who just happen to come right through resettlement. So again, just thank you all. And I just encourage all of you to, as much as we are facing increased numbers and increased pressures, to, to continue to have faith in the work we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Jennifer. Yeah, I'm just going to answer the question that I see in the chat. Where are the different? What is the difference between asylum seekers and refugee claimants? And I think it's really important because I think in the past they were simultaneously used, you know, at the same time. Um, there has been a change in how we're seeing those terminology, especially with the provincial funded programs for safe haven. Um, so asylum seekers are people who have. Um, come through the border, whether it's in, you know, and, and have no, have not made a claim of acknowledgement, anything to the claim process. Um, a refugee claimant has made a claim processing that they would like to be considered um, to apply for refugee protection. Um, in both cases, it does not mean that they are a protected person, but one has actually done the process of documentation to say that they are looking to get the refugee claim process in place, and the other has not made that claim. And it's, just important recently to make that determination because of the types of supports and services are, are slightly varied um, in, in the context of, of, of sort of the refugee claimants and then services that's available. Um, in terms of last comments, I think, you know, again, really echo what Michael has said, you know, it, it's it's been, you know, and for myself working in this sector, just a great opportunity and honor to be working in this sector with some of the, you know, a lot of people here who um, our partners and we work together. And I think that's a really important piece is that we continue to sort of work together to support refugees. Um, we've got claimants, guards, privately sponsors, um, people who are new in Canada, just because it's not easy. Um, it's challenged in a variety of ways and just the ability to have us to um, work together to support, um, you know, a group that, you know, are successful, but are challenged initially when they first arrive, I think it's just um, important. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Michael. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, of course, a special thank you to Michael and Jennifer for your time, your expertise, your invite, your valuable insights, and also your your dedication to supporting uh, refugees and refugee claimants is also greatly appreciated. We would also like to acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia through the Ministry of uh, municipal affairs. Um, uh, I did record this session and I'll be posting it on the BC Refugee Hub website and you can go to bcrefugeehub.ca and um, join for our, our e-newsletter mailing list and then once it's available I send it out through the e-newsletter. Um, lastly, I wanted to thank our audience for the incredible, incredible work that you're doing in supporting refugees and refugee claimants and echoing what Jennifer and Michael both have said. We really appreciate your time and dedication. And ultimately, we are all here to support refugees um, who arrive in Canada, feel welcome um, in their new homes. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for sticking with us uh, about 14 minutes extra today. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.